please tell me, what is a quick summary of your book, The Hidden Half of Nature? The Hidden Half of Nature is really about this emerging, burgeoning area in science that is telling us how important the microbial world is for not only our well-being and health, but also that of our crops that we eat. In fact, every plant on this planet and basically every living organism. We people often think we're very special, we're different than other life forms, but what we're learning from microbiome research is that there are other life forms that are actually a part of our body, and it's microorganisms. And so some people are, well, what's a microorganism? It's pretty simple. They're single-celled organisms, and because they're single-celled, they are too small for us to see with the naked eye. So they've sort of been out of our mind because we can't see them, but they form a really uh, important part of our body. And I came to this realization um, with my co-author and husband, David Montgomery, when we wrote The Hidden Half of Nature. And in The Hidden Half of Nature, we weave in some history, some, some personal memoir and experience, and also a good deal of the science itself to tell the story of microbiomes and why we all need to really understand understand them a lot better than we do and have people sort of appreciate this this part of nature which in fact is a part of our bodies. How does soil health affect the health of our gut and microbiome? That is a good question and it's not completely understood. But there's some dots that researchers are starting to connect, and it's also an area that I'm interested in writing more about and researching myself. Because the basic idea is this, and this was, this was first sort of hypothesized uh, in the early part of the 20th century by some British farmers, people who um, do organic farming probably know the name Sir Albert Howard. And he had a peer around this time, this would have been in the 1930s, 1940s, Lady Eve Balfour. And what they had noticed in England and Howard uh, in India where he was doing a lot of work is that when crops were sick, that translated into sick animals, pigs and cows, chickens and so on, and that rippled out to people. And so this, this chain of poor health um, would ripple from the soil where we're growing our crops all the way to the people who are eating it. And so what we're learning now, partly through microbiome research, is that a plant's green body is really quite miraculous, and especially the root system. And when you have a fully functioning soil microbiome, and that area around the roots we call the root microbiome, when that's fully functioning, which is to say dense and abundant with beneficial microorganisms. When that is in play, you get robust, healthy plants or crops, and that means nutrient density, that means they're able to incorporate many of the elements and nutrients in soil into their green bodies. Animals or people that eat those nutrient-dense plants are therefore getting all of the minerals and elements that we need for our health. And so that's the connection. And, and we know some dots, but we're still trying to connect that all up. And as it is connecting up, it is also um, telling us a lot about agricultural practices, about diets, about how we're all, all sort of linked at the hip, if you will, from the soil to the, the way our biochemistry and metabolism and many, many cellular activities are, are working in our bodies. What is a microbiome? That is a good question. What is a microbiome? It refers to really um, the communities of microbes. So that could be bacteria, even virus, fungi, and maybe some other organisms that are part of a community and they inhabit what's called a host. People are hosts, plants are hosts, fish, cats, dogs, all, every, every living thing has its own microbiome. And microbiomes are unique. Mine is as different 
from yours as it is to people who are watching this. No two are alike. And the whole thing about microbiomes, which is a little bit counterintuitive for some people if they haven't either been um, heard of this before, is that we once thought we shouldn't have microbes around us. These are pathogens, they cause disease. But what we're learning is that, in fact, it's the presence of microorganisms and not their absence, which keeps us healthy and well, at least helps to. And a microbiome, therefore, on the whole, is more beneficial to us or plants than it is harmful. And that gets into questions of then, um, I think we need to be talking about microbiomes a lot more than we do because many people don't exactly understand what one is and they, they really don't necessarily understand how is it then that we can sort of take care of our microbiome. And I think about the care aspect as, as sort of you know three basic things. You wanna, you wanna first of all protect your microbiome because if you're protecting it, you're not losing it. Because when you lose it or a portion of it or something takes a hit, then you're looking at some sort of restorative activity, which we all know nothing is ever quite as good if you have to rebuild it as, as it is when you first get it. So protection, restoration, and then whether you have your your own microbiome that's never taken a hit, which is probably pretty unlikely, or you have a some portion that's been restored, you wanna cultivate it. Because these are living organisms, living communities that are really sitting in an ecosystem that is our gut. So it's protect, restore, and cultivate that microbiome. How do we keep in close contact with the microbes that benefit our health while protecting ourselves from those that cause ill health and disease? Yes. And Ever since writing The Hidden Half of Nature and, and giving this topic um, a lot of thought, what I have learned is there's one thing about the microbial world, and it's this. It is filled with duality. It is the classic double-edged sword. Because like the question implied, we need these microbes that are a part of our microbiome, but there's some hitchhikers sometimes in these microbial communities, and these are the pathogens. These are the disease-causing organisms. So say from the bacterium that causes TB to a virus in more modern times that causes HIV. So what we want to be thinking about is let's minimize our exposure to the bad actors and let's maximize our exposure to the good actors of the microbiome. And so what that means is we're going to want to be making sure that through our diet, through visits to the doctor, that if there's things that look like they might be impacting the microbiome negatively, that we think about a behavior before we do something. So when it comes to these beneficial microorganisms that make up our microbiome, they are very, very sensitive to uh, the introduction of other things to their community, and that includes pathogens. And so if a pathogen comes into the gut, let's say, um, those microbiota that are a part of our microbiome, they can send signals to the cells that line our gut to say, hey, human being, you need to amp up the production of antimicrobial compounds because we just noticed the arrival of such and such a pathogen. And so there's this communication between the immu our immune system and, and our beneficial microorganisms where as long as our immune system sort of knows friend from foe and it's getting all the communication and information that it needs from our microbiome, we can take care of, of, of pathogens that way. And by take care, I mean kill them off, get them out of the body. So this is why you really wanna be nurturing and taking care of your microbiome because they work in concert with our immune system to deal with um, to deal with these bad actors. And the other thing, you know, I had mentioned this duality, this double-edged sword aspect of the microbiome, and this is what's very um, 
can be problematic. It's very interesting if you're a researcher, and that is that some of these beneficial microbes are only beneficial in certain circumstances. They can turn and they can become pathogenic. And th that can happen through uh, a change in a person's diet, perhaps. It can certainly happen with the introduction of antibiotics, which, which can wreak havoc on the microbiome because it's antibiotics are a good thing to have if you've got a serious infection, but if you don't and you're taking them either um, on purpose or you're getting them inadvertently through something in your diet, it scrambles and it perturbs the microbiome. And it's when you get those kind of, I would call it sort of a, a confusion, um, bacterial members will all of a sudden not quite stay in their beneficial role and they'll start, they can start doing other things which are problematic. And so that's why if you let these communities um, be who they are, communicate how they communicate with themselves and with their host organism, that's really the best recipe for, for using and letting our, our microbiome you know, work just like it's supposed to. Thank you.